Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Heather George, uh, Curator Indigenous Histories at the Canadian Museum of History. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Access, Engagement and Knowledge Community Collaborations with the Canadian Museum of History uh, session. So now I would like to turn things over to uh, Jameson Britt from the Canadian Museum of History. Sego Suat Huego, as we gather, let's give thanks for this beautiful day and the opportunity to greet one another as colleagues and friends. Let's put our minds together in the spirit of sharing and reconciliation by making peace with the past, nurturing our souls today, and setting ourselves with positive and imperative intentions for our future generations. My name is Jameson Brandt. I'm a member of the Ganyangi Haga Mohawk Nation in lineage with lineage from Six Nations of the Grand River and Tyndanega Mohawk Territory. I'm honored to join you here today from our home, homeland of Kundege, a place many of you know as the Mohawks of Bay of Quinte. This afternoon, I join you alongside colleagues from the Canadian Museum of History and spokespeople from two of the Indigenous communities who are partnering on projects with the National Museum. Our session is entitled Access, Engagement and Knowledge, Community con con Collaborations with the Canadian Museum of History. This panel highlights collaborative projects. Canadian Museum of History, also known as CMH, is working on with Indigenous peoples. We are pleased to provide examples of community access to cultural material, collaborative, collaborative approaches to research and incorporating Indigenous perspectives into the documentation and care of collections. Building on decades of collaboration and repatriation work, these projects exemplify the museum's current framework for Indigenous relations, which is focused on redefining the museum's commitment to Indigenous peoples across Canada. Next slide, please. Our presenters today are Tolina Atfield and Taylor Gibson, Caroline Marchand and Sylvia Morin, and Michelle Gervais. Moderator for the session is Heather George, who may have, many of you have many of you have known, may have known from her work with Mary Collier in initiating work toward the first OMA Indigenous Collection Symposium in 2017. Thank you both for your continuing dedication to these important conversations. To our credit, Heather joined the role of, of curator Indigenous history at the CMH last fall and we continue to be inspired by her enthusiasm and commitment to the field. Time has been set aside for questions and answers at the conclusion, but feel free to use the Q&A feature to put down your thoughts and we'll do our best to accommodate as the session proceeds. Next slide, please. I will begin with an introduction to the Canadian Museum of History's recently implemented framework for Indigenous relations and then introduce the panelists who will describe some of our content and ongoing work. Slide four, please. The framework for Indigenous relations is a first for the Canadian Museum of History, developed to redefine our commitment to Indigenous peoples across Canada. Its purpose is to create institutional change, strengthen relationships between museums and Indigenous peoples, and provide a respectful and mutually beneficial path forward. It commits the museum to increasing cultural competence while fulfilling its mandate. The museum has a long and complex history of engagement and collaboration with Indigenous communities in Canada. What's changed is that the December 2020 introduction of the framework marks a period of rec reflection on past practice and renewed commitment evolving relationship. We've laid out a set of principles and strategic objectives based on access, engagement, and knowledge. Next slide, please. As the largest museum of human history in the country, the bulk of the CMH collection relates to Indigenous peoples and cultures. It includes roughly 55,000 ethnographic objects, several million archaeological items, 
sacred and ceremonial materials, and indigenous ancestral remains. In most cases, these are supported by associated documentation, photographs, and films. Due to the sensitive nature of some of the materials, in recent history, we've been working with the indigenous communities to respectfully manage these collections. While most of the indigenous materials are collect were collected between 1880 and 1940, a systematic plan for acquisition of indigenous content formally commenced in 20, uh, sorry, 1910. Next slide, please. Prompted by the formalization of a dedicated anthropology department, this was a period of careful and deliberated acquisition. Collections were amassed through processes of purchase, donation, international exchange, geological survey work, anthropology pursuit, medical and missionary interests, government directives, and professional collecting, among others. Next slide, please. The museum acknowledges its colonial past and the likelihood that some acquisitions were made under duress or taken without consent. Therefore, a comprehensive collections history project has been initiated to consider these acquisitions in the new light by seeking out historically problematic transactions and then reaching out to initiate repatriation. Since that questionable period in Canada's history, acquisition of Indigenous content is aimed solely at Indigenous arts and crafts and is carried out in collaboration with community members and artists. Our effort has shifted to engage, partner, co-curate, share authority, and discuss our collections with Indigenous communities. For Indigenous projects and exhibitions, we work with advisory committees and Indigenous curators and aspire to augment representation and voice in exhibitions. Next slide, please. Incorporation of a traditional care program for sacred materials in the museum's collections began in the 1970s. This initiative enabled Indigenous ceremonialists and knowledge keepers to conduct appropriate doings and have a say in considerations over care, handling, storage, and exhibition, which in prior times would have been purely institution led. Since 1978, the museum has returned belongings and Indigenous ancestors to their communities of origin. Our decisions for improving the relationship between museums and Indigenous peoples have more recently been informed by four key documents. The Task Force Report on Museums and First Peoples, released in 1992. From it, we in initiated the Sacred Materials Project and the Indigenous Internship Program in 1993. Subsequently, the 2001 Repatriation Policy. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples Report. Released in 1996, this led to improved documentation, cataloging, and the creation of inventories to be made available for communities to initiate the repatriation process. Next slide, please. Canada's 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission report uh, and several of its calls, and then specific articles contained in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, released in 2007 and endorsed by Canada in 2015. Each has marked its place in the evolution of how to carefully consider, negotiate, and implement our path given our unique situation, as we aspire to develop consistency and improvement of respectful practice. From the CMH, in 2016, a dedicated repatriation and indigenous relations unit was formalized. Our work targets, shared authority, co-curatorship, work with indigenous advisors on projects and greater representation in exhibitions. Through these efforts, we are receiving more Indigenous visitors and researchers and in turn witnessing a revitalization of Indigenous practices, languages, and art forms. Next slide, please.
The framework for indigenous relations aims to formalize and expand in a respectful way. Developing it involved an assessment of the museum's existing activities and processes in several key sectors. Over a period of two years, we consulted with employees from across the museum, provided high level overviews and in-depth process reviews. We engaged externally by consulting alumni from the CMH Indigenous Internship Program, external experts who work in areas such as repatriation, archives, intellectual property, and Indigenous access to collections. In addition, we sought revisions and recommendations from the Indigenous Heritage Circle, an Indigenous-led organization dedicated to the advancement of Indigenous cultural heritage. We are grateful to all who participated and provided us with critical advice, suggestions, and wisdom. Slide 11, please. The framework is one of several documents guiding the museum. It has been implemented to function alongside the CMH Board of Directors Strategic Directions 2020 to 25, which include directives on respectful collaborations and shared stewardship with Indigenous peoples. The 2013 Research Strategy, which stipulates Museological Leadership, Contemporary Canada, the Changing North, Indigenous Histories, and Cultural Expression. The 2016 Collections Development Plan, which advocates collection knowledge, commitment to Canadians, and museum ethics, including updated processes, practices, and better understanding of Indigenous perspective on approaches to collection management, and the 2019 Framework for Cultural Activities, which stipulates engagement, collaboration, and inclusivity in developing exhibitions and programs. Next slide, please. The museum's strength lies in its collections and their associated histories. These collections are a symbol of pride for Canadians and reflect the communities the country's complex history. For some, these, those related to Indigenous history symbolize what has been lost by the communities. To address this, the framework marks the museum's efforts more intentional, to be more intentional and proactive based on three principles, transparency, accountability, and shared authority. We are committed to work with Indigenous peoples through sharing clear policies and respectful engagement. We will carefully consider our complex past and, and consult with Indigenous peoples proactively to better inform future decisions. We will exercise shared authority in partnership with Indigenous communities by acknowledging interrelated but distinct roles and clear decision-making processes. Next slide, please. This initiative was created with three strategic priorities in mind, access, engagement, and knowledge. Indigenous collections and materials, both tangible and intangible, are accessed regularly by Indigenous community members, scholars, artists, and the general public. The museum acknowledges that these collections are inextricably linked to the communities of origin and central to the cultural well-being of Indigenous peoples. Access to Indigenous cultural materials requires a process that values respect, institutional best practices, and a welcoming space. Aside from on-site visits, we also aspire to increase opportunities for access to the collections within the Indigenous communities themselves when possible. The framework is designed to enhance engagement with the creators of Indigenous material culture, stories, and histories by acknowledging, respecting, and exercising control through consultation and consent as stipulated in the UNDRIP. We commit to doing this by ensuring increased opportunities for Indigenous voice and, and curation, extended engagement for exhibitions and programs, and consultation with collections while at the same time making a conscious effort to not place any undue burden on Indigenous communities. One of the key functions of the museum is to promote knowledge and disseminate information. The TRC highlighted the role museums can play in reconciliation, 
both with the public and within our own institutions. Public education extends beyond research, exhibitions, and public programs. In our own unique roles, we can all do our part in respecting Indigenous culture in every aspect of museum operations. The CMH is striving to ensure consistent messaging and values in ways it communicates with the public, starting by strengthening the cultural competence of employees and finding ways to share museological expertise. Next slide, please. The CMH's framework for Indigenous relations is intended to provide a new structure for Indigenous relations at the museum and will affect most of its divisions. It envisions a renewed re approach while continuing to build upon past experiences. The framework is accompanied by an implementation plan starting with Indigenous cultural sensitivity training for all employees. To that end, every CMH employee completed the training in January 2021. Any new employees will be required to complete the training upon commencement of their duties at the museum. So I just want to close out by adding that um, Sorry, that's fine. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I want to now uh, welcome a, a, a presentation entitled To Make Something, a collaborative effort led by Talina Atfield and Taylor Gibson. Talina Atfield has been a researcher of Haudenosaunee history and material culture since 2005. She is an artist, working as curator of Eastern Ethnology at the Canadian Museum of History since 2015. Talina completed her PhD in Anthropology and Indigenous Material Culture. Taylor Gibson is a member of the Cuga Nation who is raised in the culture and is fluent in the language. He has been researching and working with Haudenosaunee historical material since 2006. Taylor has served as an instructor of Haudenosaunee history language and spirituality, and is well-versed in protocol and contemporary practices. Delina and Taylor. All right, so welcome, Swiggle. Uh, my English name is Taylor Gibson, uh, Turtle Clan, Cuga Nation, Uswega, uh, Tkidro, so I'm from Six Nations. Um, I don't know, do you, do you want to go, Talina? <laughs> Yeah. Um, my name is Selena Atfield. Um, I am a curator of Eastern Ethnology with the Canadian Museum of History. And um, Taylor and I are really happy to be here today uh, to present uh, the project that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, we've been working on this project with Rick Hill and have more recently brought in a couple of other team members. Um, Tennis Hill and Kevin White. Um, so this project is, um, well, we're hoping to present to you today this project uh, to show you how we've been using museum archives and material culture um, to bring this back into communities through community-led cooperative efforts. So we're going to give you sort of um, an overview of the, the first part of our um, multi-year project. This part is called Sagado, Tell Me a Story. Um, and uh, the first couple of years of our project, we've um, been fortunate to receive Canada Council for the Arts funding. So we'll be empl um, employing that funding to start translating some of the stories uh, back into um, our nation's six languages. So from uh, here, I guess, uh, next slide, please. And uh, Taylor, you can take it from here for a couple of slides. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll tell you. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background on how we got into this project. Um, I think it was about 20, uh, 2014, I was a re researcher at uh, Dale Hahake or the Indigenous Knowledge Center. And we got visited by some folks from the American Philosophical Society. Uh, one of them was Brian Carpenter. And um, it was a good, a good meeting. And so they ended up uh, inviting us out to Philadelphia to, uh, to study some of the collections out there. And so we did, and it was a really good experience, and we learned a lot. And uh, on our way back, they gave us a CD, and it, was, it contained all these stories in there. And one of the things working at the center, it takes like, I don't know, it's so busy all the time. Like, 
uh, it would take about a year just to get into it. So I finally started looking at these stories, and then I realized that um, uh, there was actually a lot more into these stories than kind of meets the eye there. Like, uh, there was actually a lot of cultural information embedded within the story. And having those cultural lenses to see that stuff, you know, it's like, hey, that means something. There's got to be more information to this. That's what I kept thinking in my mind. And so uh, I made some short presentations to some folks in the, uh, the APS. And so they had created a grant for us to go down to uh, the Canadian History Museum and to research this collection further. And so myself and uh, uh, Rick Hill, uh, we traveled out to the Canadian History Museum, I think it was 2018 or so. And so that's where we met Talina. <laughs> and so that's where I snapped that photo there. We we're looking at some of the collections that Wall had collected. And on the, on the left he has, there's uh, snow snakes. And so that's still like a really popular game amongst the Haudenosaunee communities. It's not so much like outside, the outside. It hasn't really uh, made it onto the mainstream yet. Um, not, not so much like lacrosse or the Gajik place, lacrosse or anything like that, but it's still like a, it's still widely played amongst the Haudenosaunee communities. And uh, it's interesting there because they also go into, um, no, I'm just, I'll, I'll just wait because I get too excited and then, and then I want to keep talking about this stuff. So I'll just stop from there and we'll just say next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So I get too excited and then I just want to keep talking about everything. All right. That's a good so, thing. <laughs> because <laughs> there is a lot of things to talk about and that's the other thing I wanted to mention is that we won't yeah. be able to cover everything in this stuff because the story is quite long and so I just want to give you a little bit of information about the Six Nations community where, where I live um, so this is a watercolor uh, painted in 1806 so this is one of the first like snapshots of our community I guess you want to call it that or one of the first imagery of our community so that's the uh, Mohawk Chapel there and so that building is still there today and it's uh, uh, one of two um, royal chapels in Canada the other one is out in Tainanega and the other one's in Brantford and uh, so what you have to write is the original Haldeman deed. So these were the lands granted underneath the Haldeman deed after the American Revolution. Uh, it was obtained by Joseph Brandt. And so a lot of the loyalists who followed uh, Joseph Brandt, uh, my relatives included, <laughs> uh, we ended up over here. And so some of the things that were going on, like there was land dealings and some was fair, some was fair, some was stolen. And uh, so, you know what I mean? That was just a like, complicated issue. And what ended up happening was the reserve ended up getting like smaller and smaller and smaller up until where, where we're at now. And so what they call it, this area here is a Tuscarora Township. So you see it in red there. So that's what's left of the original lands. And you can imagine it is quite a battle just to get any type of land back. <laughs> but that's what we have left. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of sad, it's, it's really sad when you look at it, but yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, sorry, let's, let's move on to the next slide. Sorry, I don't wanna, uh, All right, so this one here, uh, and so I, with this photo here, I, uh, these photos here, I really want to, um, you kind of get the time and sense of when uh, uh, Frederick Wilkerson Wah or Wah and Wah come into our communities and did this research and what was happening in our communities. So the, the larger picture of all the uh, hereditary chiefs on there is the, what they call the last uh, photo of all the hereditary chiefs together prior to the elected system coming in. So it's a very significant photo. Uh, there's actually some folks or some chiefs that are photographed in this uh, who participate in the uh, wall study. So I, I know you can't see my mouse or anything like that, but the person that's hanging on the rail, his name is Tom Smook, Tom Smook. And then, yeah, that's him there. That's Tom Smook there. And so he actually has a lot of like stories and he has, provides a lot of language material, uh, especially interviews and other photographs. And then one of the other fellows here, I know it's hard, you can't see it. Um, I would say he's uh, third to the third from the left. He's kind of standing with his legs out and his hands up. Over. Oh, maybe the other left then. <laughs> this, uh, yep, down, down. I see the mouse there. So he's, he's sitting down. Yep, 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 okay. So that's John Arthur Gibson. And so he was like one of the most widely respected chiefs of our time, or of, of that time, sorry. Uh, he was a Seneca chief, but uh, Hewitt, like if you know anything about J.M.B. Hewitt, uh, he, he um, praised like for uh, praised John, or Jonathan Gibson for his knowledge, and one of the major things that's really interesting about it is that he um, recorded the concerning the league. So the most official version of our great law was recorded by uh, Jonathan Gibson and Alexander Goldenweiser, and it will come up in a second. And so the person on your right, uh, you have David Jack, who uh, participated widely in law study from all the way up until the beginning, right until the end, is uh, David Jack holding the two roll of wampum. And then the person on his left is Asia R. Hill. And really interesting history here is that Asia R. Hill would go on to support the, the loyalists um, during the 1924 stuff. So he would oppose the Skahe and things like that. And so he wanted to get the elected system uh, Im implemented into Six Nations. And there was like a big controversy and there was like, it was really divisive. 
And so the two wampum boats you have, you see pictured there are the wampum boats that um, this guy takes to Geneva with him. So <laughs> there's a lot of history rolled up into this photograph, right? And you know, it's just, it's just so much interesting stuff going on. And why Wa's collection is are really important for our community is it's just, it's this time from 1911 to 1918, uh, where we get like photographs, we get interviews, we get a lot of cultural information uh, between that time. And it's really rare because up until that point, uh, most people have only talked about 1924 around this time. So we don't really know about the, the other things that were going on and what the people were like and, you know, what they were experiencing at that time. And so it re really uh, like helps us uh, kind of understand this time more, but also ourselves more. All right, sorry, go ahead and next slide. Okay, so, um, so Frederick Waugh, he was a little bit different than other collectors of his time. Um, so he did collect for Sapir for the Canadian Museum of History, and he collected mostly uh, between 1911 and 1924. Um, in, a, in a bunch of different communities. So he's at Onondaga Castle, Oneida on the Thames, uh, Six Nations, Kahnawake, um, and uh, Tonawanda. And so he's amassed a master collection, um, a very nice one with, um, you know, he, he names women and he names uh, people in the photographs. Uh, he's, his collection is accompanied by a really rich um, documentation and field notes and so he names people he puts a lot of the language in his field notes um, and he uh, he put a lot of really detailed sketches and detailing of like production processes for making things so um, yeah he was born in Langford Ontario um, he was a newspaper editor and collector uh, before he was hired uh, to collect for the museum um, he actually disappeared near Ganawage in 1924, and the mystery has never been solved. So they're not sure what happened to him, which is very sad. Um, but he did work under uh, Stapir alongside Marius Barbeau, um, Golden Weiser, and Speck. And he was uh, collecting in Six Nations the same time a Golden Weiser was. And so they were, uh, Wa was focused more on, I don't know, a lot of people might be familiar with his Wa Foods um, publication. Uh, one of the few things that he did put out, uh, but he and Golden Weiser stuff talks to each other pretty well too. Uh, they were collecting a little bit different, but at the same time in the same places with the same people. And um, John Arthur Gibson as well, as Taylor had mentioned, was also uh, working and collecting and some of his stuff came in at the same time to the museum. Um, so next slide, please. So the collection, and this is what's forming uh, most of uh, our research and forming most of our research at this time. So we have um, a lot of field notes, 46 um, books of field notes uh, that contain, like I had mentioned, language, detailed language notes, names of people, names of people in their own languages, names of women, names of children, family relationships, um, detailed production processes. It's, it's pretty incredible and I've been going through from the material culture side of things, um, trying to reconcile his uh, everything that he's written about, things he deposited into our collection, uh, from the field notes into our collection. So he collected a, about 540 um, items of material culture. And what's um, what I think is a lot different about him from other collectors around his time was that because he didn't have a background specifically in scientific studies, anthropology, archaeology, history, he didn't come at his collecting with a sort of specified lens, like um, grained in any sort of methodology or anything. So he seemed to be looking for mostly items and utensils for food, food preparation. And, um, you know, he collected a lot of samples of seeds, beans, uh, corn, stuff like that. Um, but he also, um, he spent a lot of time with people and he did collect things that you know, he was looking for, like many others were at the time, old and authentic sort of things, but he also or, um, asked for reproductions, he bought things, commissioned things, and um, he was looking for everyday items, which is what makes this collection really rich. Um, and so, yeah, there is also 250 photographs that he took um, of, you know, the spaces and the people and the items and things like that. So. Uh, it's a really rich, rich collection that we're working with, and um, it's going to be a multi-year, several-phase project. Our first phase is going to be focusing on the stories, and then 
from there we'll move to the material culture. Um, but okay, so we'll go to the next slide now and Taylor, you can pick back up from here. Okay, thanks, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so I just created like this short map to show you like all the places that he traveled to and then the years. So one of the busiest years was 1912. And so that's when you would go on and visit like pretty much all the communities, all the Six Nations communities. And you know, just some of the stuff that he got from these different communities is amazing. And a lot of it relates to other communities, but there is some sp specific uh, regional knowledge or local knowledge. Um, so if you're from Gwangwage, if you're from <laughs> Cataragas, or you're from uh, uh, Oneida, you, you might want to look at some of the material that's here as well. Um, and, oh, and so the little box there is uh, where Langford, Ontario is. I know it doesn't really help too much, but um, so where Six Nations is, it's literally a stone's throw away, uh, away because it's just like you can walk there pretty much. <laughs> like it's really short distance. And so we don't really know if he had any type of other interactions with indigenous, like with Six Nations people up until that point uh, in 1911 or, or not. Uh, again, a lot of stuff still remains a mystery. All right, well, thanks. Uh, next slide, please. And so one of the things that was extremely helpful here that uh, the museum shared was uh, what they call the informant list. And so that's uh, usually, uh, how do I want to say it? Like, I would want to say like a controversial term, informant, but uh, I don't know. A lot of the a lot of the things I've heard anyway was uh, getting away from this term of using informant, but more like community scholar, because it just feels like you're yeah. informing on it. But it's there's like getting away from that type of thing, <clears throat> which I find is we, interesting. We've been but... employed the we've been employing mm -hmm. the community scholar term for our project. Yeah, and it's been extremely helpful. And this list has been extremely helpful too because you look for the names and come through the names. But one of the things that happens though is that there's actually a lot of people who aren't mentioned in here. And it's like, well, why? But no, it was really good anyway, just to help get an idea of who's there. And we're going back to what, um, I want to see if that was true or not. And so going back to what Talina had said, like you would write down like the person's name if they were a woman, they'd write down their full name. So one of them was uh, that, that, uh, Katie Gibson. And so she's, they said she's about 100 years old at the time. That's what he wrote down on her. He took a photograph of her. And she tells a couple of stories within the collection. And so like, and then another person that they have is this um, Lydia Sugar. Like he'd write down like their full names and stuff, which is uh, extremely good. <laughs> extremely helpful, especially when he has all these photographs and, you know, putting a name to them. Like, oh, so helpful. Um, all right. And it also shows you where they're from and uh, what language they spoke. All right. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so one of the things I thought was really interesting, and just to touch back a little bit what Telena said when was while when Wa had come to their community, um, that, that was his first trip was coming to, to meet uh, Jonathan Gibson and uh, uh, Alexander Goldenweiser. And the, in his first notebook here, this 1911 notebook, that was what he wrote. That's like pretty much the first page is having dinner with the chief and Alexander Goldenweiser. <laughs> so I, would, I wish he would have wrote more about it. Um, he just kind of wrote about the butter, the language of the butter, and like all that kind of stuff. Like it was kind of interesting what he was talking about because it was, it's useful. But like I, you know, I, if you've got time to talk with him, I want to hear like a, a like some history or something. Uh, I just found it was interesting that that's the thing that he would document is like the words for language or the language for butter and like different things they had around his house. It's interesting either way, and so you get a, a sense of like his notebooks as well too. Like I always find that pretty interesting that, that he can show like his earlier set of notebooks. Compared to his later set of notebooks, it looks more professional and everything like that. But I don't know, it's just like these red books or something. It's just really like, it's really pleasing to see these books and, um, you know, just the information that they contain. Um, I don't know what else I want to add to that. Um, is, is there anything you want to add to this, Delina, or we can go to the next slide? Um, I think, yeah, I think we're going to run out of time, so we might have to breeze through the rest. But um... All right. <laughs> well, we can go through the next. We can go through the next slide really quick. Um, it's just so that some of the things that we did find was sketches, and then you can see that like uh, the different things that he was seeing, and you can even see on the top of the photo above there. Uh, sorry, the picture above. You can see he was using shorthand a lot too, and so that's going to be difficult to translate. <laughs> All right. So yeah, um, he, next he actually slide. did have kind of oh, sorry, like his sorry. own shorthand language. Wa had a lot of his own shorthand language, which is. Um, kind of indecipherable, but we're working through it. Right, right. And so, so this is a good sample of the, what's in the collection. We have a lot of photographs. So um, John Jameson Jr. and uh, David Jack were two um, community scholars that uh, Wa employed a lot, like especially John Jameson Jr. who was a uh, Anadaga speaking Cuga. And that's one of the things you'll notice a lot that he writes down is that a lot of the men around the community, they speak the language of their father. 
which I thought was something interesting. And another person that's an example of that is Seth Newhouse, who is uh, Anadaga but speaks Mohawk. And he's also in this collection too. We just don't have time to include him in there. And then David Jack has uh, so many stories in there and he talks a lot about his oral history, of it, especially of his grandmother and like what they experienced. Um, a lot of these people would be born about 1835. And so they would experience a lot, especially David Jack and John Jameson Jr. And then you see some of the notes and so this is where it can get extremely helpful. And so one of them, one, this is one sample of it, but it, it was games. And so they explained like how to, how to wrestle and they'd have the phrasing and the rules and then the words that you use for it. Uh, and uh, what do they say? Tomba this again. So that's cute that it means uh, the bends, bends, he bends his strength. <laughs> and then so they have like two different phrases and then they have the different rules. And so this is something that's been lost in my community. It would be extremely useful to learn about. All right, and then so the other things you have is material culture. So you have the hide scraper. So again, you're, you're, this is only a snapshot of things because what do you, like they actually have step by step on how to tan hides, which is amazing and extremely helpful and useful. And it talks about the tools there. And so that's the hide scraper. And then uh, the other thing that he has is a uh, nahaga or white corn. And so a lot of food specimens. But if you pick up his book, uh, uh, Iroquois Food and Preparations, you understand why he has like so much. Uh, uh, I hate to call it food specimens because I think it has like there's it lacks like the spiritual <laughs> connection towards it. You know what I mean? It's Genhiko or, or life sustainers. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of that stuff in there as well too. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, we're just gonna try to get through it now. I knew this was gonna happen. <laughs> I can't shut up. <laughs> we uh, we we did this last time too. We apologize. Um, if we do really need to stop, we can share our slides, but we we might be able to just like whip through them if people are so interested in seeing what we have. I want to get into this one real quick though. So okay. in his original notebook, he would attend the ceremonies. And so he would like, that's really interesting that he would go to these cer our ceremonies and he'd write down everything that happened, the singers, the names of the singers, what was happening and why they're doing it and all that kind of stuff. Extremely useful and helpful. But I thought it was funny. One of the things that he mentions in his notebook was he asked if a white man could dance. And so they gave him an answer. They said, you can if you get adopted or you're well known amongst the community. And so that was in 1911. And so in 1912, he writes this letter to Helen Merrill. Um, it was about like the folklore. And sorry, I just have to say like a, a big now to uh, Catherine Falls of Archives, Ontario. She sent me this letter because um, she realized that what we were doing and stuff like that. And she thought it was important to send to us. So now like the Catherine uh, Falls from Archives, Ontario. I just wanted to mention that. So this letter that he wrote, he talks about, um, he writes to her and says that he's been adopted into the Oneida Nation when he was out doing uh, field, re field research and the Oneida the Thames there. And so he gets this name Talagoros. And so you might have noticed that at the beginning, I mean, so he splits the sun and he got adopted into the Cuga, uh, turtle or sorry, Oneida Turtle Clan. And I just thought it was interesting that uh, he wrote, he, so I want, that makes me wonder like how much of it was he was really interested in you know, part, being a, a participant within the culture as well too. And I don't know if I think maybe that's what separates from his like professionalism to work compared to like the amateurism, I guess, I don't know. But maybe that's a good thing because it gives him an ident identity. And that was like extremely important. Like with the name, you have now you have an identity. Now people know you in the community. So that's good. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think that's really good that he did that and that he was able to get that far. Um, sorry, next slide, please. We'll just try to get through it. And if you have questions about this stuff and you want to know more, you can always ask me. And just to get an idea of what's in there. So a part of the 157 stories that was given to us by the APS. They're all typed up. But one of the things that we found out was that there's actually um, some differences between the actual written notebook compared to what's been typed up and polished. So that's one example of one of the stories in there. And so it's by David Jack. And so he tells it in the frame of his grandmother. And so it's like her history that's, that he's sharing. And so you get a lot of sense of that oral history within this text. <laughs> and then this one too is really interesting. I won't go into it, but it's a really good story about, and it explains how Anadagas, some Anadagas who traveled from New York had come to stay with six nation, uh, some of the six nations here, some of the Cugas and move further up uh, the river there. And so it explains like a lot of like our history and how, how things kind of come to be and how people got here and stuff like that is really good. And one of the things they write on there is no good, but that story is extremely good and helpful for us to understand it. All right, sorry, next slide. I don't, sorry, I don't mean to keep going over time and everything like that, but one of the things that was just really interesting, I'll just really briefly, so this is PJ Atkins. Uh, we had an image here, but um, something happened with our, uh, our um, email here, like the image got left out or something. But he had um, corresponded with Wa about 1913. And so like we understand that 
PJ Atkins and Wah had some type of correspondence. And so that might've been how Wah got into the community is through talking with PJ Atkins. And so what he talks about, tells us about PJ Atkins is that he was kind of like a, a, a postmaster, a general store, uh, thing like that. And so where he, li where he lived is like on a corner on, on the reserve there. And, it's divided division and roads. So I just know because my old school used to be on that on that on this they call it a fifth line. And so on the corner there, there was this big giant house there, and they would say it's like this postmaster's house. And so uh, up until this point, when like studying the collection, now you find out it's PJ Atkins's house. <laughs> and so that corner there, that's where like where our schools are and stuff like that. But there used to be this building there, and you know, I was I would always remember it. And they would always say it's the postmaster's house. But uh, it's interesting to get a name to it. And when I was looking through some of the uh, library archives or records as well. I come across this. Uh, so one of the things that he was doing for our people was also giving relief orders. So like if you didn't have any money, you could go up to council and uh, the predatory chiefs, they would give you like uh, so much food you would get from PJ Atkins. And so we would take it to council and then they'd pay the, pay the receipt. I just thought it was really interesting that he would actually have his photograph on the thing. Like I've never seen that before. Like I never seen that on like a receipt before, like somebody's actual photo like that. So I just thought it was really interesting. And so it has a bit of more information about him, of course. Um, sorry, next slide. I don't want to keep, uh, I could talk for days about this, <laughs> but I, I, won't, I won't. So one of the things that we found in the collection was really excited was that uh, we found this uh, Oneida creation story all in the Oneida language and it was translated as well, which is extremely, um, beneficial to us and especially like our language revitalization, right? Like, especially like looking at the old phrases or the old words and, you know, what is the English word that they use for that? And do we still understand it the same way? Like those are useful things as well as sentence structure and like forming like phrases and sentences and stuff. It's really good for language. Um, when I found this story, like I thought the rest of the stories were gonna be on the language, but there was only one other story that was just written in language that's not translated yet. Uh, but again, there were some phrases that they, they include in the stories and stuff like that that was extremely helpful. And you know, I, I documented it and made notes of all this stuff. All right, sorry, next slide. And so one of the things that we come across uh, was his, uh, his list of presentations that he did for the museum. And I think it was like from 1915 all the way up to 1916, he had, uh, he had performed the different uh, presentations about the, some of the stuff that he was researching. And so, one of the photos that they have here is that during his presentation, we can, we can only guess that it's the fire making one. <laughs> and uh, it, yeah. what we learned is it, it became like uh, very popular and people were showing up to these uh, presentations. It was drawing a lot of interest. And I should add too that uh, one of the reasons why the museum began collecting at Six Nations was there, there was a need for Northeast material. And so they needed like Six Nations material, they needed uh, Ojibwe material or Anishinaabe material. And I can't remember what else they needed, but those were the two that main ones that they needed. And so that's why Six Nations was des designated as a place to start collecting. Sorry, I forgot to add that too. Um, all right, let's, we can move to the next slide, please. And I just have to add too, like the GSC reports or the geological survey reports filled in a lot of gaps for us as well too. It was extremely helpful. <laughs> all right, so one of the things that's extremely important for us right now too is the storytelling customs. And so there's a lot of those that's mentioned in here as well. How they would have ceremony, or how, sorry, not ceremony, but how they would have like the stories um, getting together and then like even like the whole like protocol and custom of like storytelling. You know, this was something that it's not so, so common amongst my community anymore. Like we don't have these phrases or we don't use these phrases as often anymore either. This uh, guy again, here's my story. And then the, the last, uh, he hate. So this other thing, when people heard like good parts of the story that they liked, they would say he hate or he hat. And it might be, and I was talking to some of our older people about it. And though he said was like, it might be an offshoot of Anadaga saying wahe. Like he said, he said wahe, wahe. And <laughs> I have to add this in too. Uh, so one of our um, elders too that I was talking to about this, he's, you know, he passed away now, but I was talking to him about it. And um, he said he, he didn't hear uh, this hot, he, he hate before, or he hat. He, the only thing he heard before was uh, uh, he hate. <laughs> and he said, don't ever say that to anybody you don't know. <laughs> and he said, um, so when you, did, you heard a story you didn't like, you'd say he hat, and it means something like bullshit. <laughs> so I guess that's what you would say to somebody you didn't like their story or anything like that. You would say he hat. <laughs> so, Again, he mysteriously disappeared. Uh, we don't know whatever happened to him. Um, you know, it's quite a mystery. Uh, there is like a after like a police report about it. There is even a museum did an investigation about it, and they're trying to find his disappearance. And reading some of his correspondence letters between him and uh, Doctor Sapir, uh, 
Wah wrote a lot. Like that was like some like a like a trademark of his. Like to write a lot. Like he would send correspondent letters a lot. That last year, nineteen twenty four, there was something different about it. Whereas like, um, he stopped writing as much. And then the other thing he wrote in nineteen eighteen before he disappeared was that he mentioned how like Six Nations people, like a lot of the older people, had passed away now. And so a lot of his contacts and people he would c consult with had passed away. And the only person that we left to kind of talk to was this uh, Simeon Gibson, but he had gone to the, uh, he was already serving in the First World War by then. All right, so you can go to the last one now. Thank you. This last slide now. And uh, sorry again, thanks for bearing with me about this. Like I just, just really, I was just really excited about telling the story. And we're not going to finish it, but we have to say So we'll tie it up, we'll tie it up with Mark. And uh, so thank you all for listening. Uh, again, if you have questions, you know, I'd love to talk more about it, but you know, I, I felt like we were going over. So, so that's it for me. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say, Talena? That was awesome, Taylor. Nyawangoa, so much for um, talking about all that. And um, yeah, we're happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. And we look forward to discussing it with um, anyone who's interested. Thank you very much uh, to Taylor and Talena Nyawangoa. Um, the next two presenters are Caroline Marchand and Sylvia Morin, uh, stemming from a call to address issues with collection storage and exhibition experienced by the Kitigan Zibi Cultural Center. Uh, the, uh, Sylvia, who is the coordinator of the center, uh, reached out to resolve the problems. Caroline uh, is an objects conservator at the Canadian Museum of History. She responded and a little bit about Caroline, she obtained her MA in Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Property in 1985 and an MA in Archaeology with a focus on conservation in archaeological materials in 1986. As, as participants learned yesterday, Sylvia obtained her MA in Art History from Carleton University and is a graduate of the Indigenous Internship Program at the Canadian Museum of History. Caroline and Sylvia. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very uh, happy to be here. Um, we're going to talk a bit uh, more deeply about um, some aspect that Sylvia is facing uh, in, um, in her, for her collection in Kitigan TV. Um, Sylvia, would you like to talk a bit? Sure, I could introduce the why we called you. Yep. Um, so we called the Canadian Museum of History for Conservation Health um, in 2016 regarding uh, how to store our headdresses, old books, clothing, uh, where the stitches are broken or the beads are falling off. What equipment do we need to get the center up to museum type standards? And in case like the like I, you don't see my face. Uh, our internet is like, uh, uh, I guess the hydro uh, is flickering. <laughs> uh, we invited our community to participate in the workshop once we got a hold of Caroline uh, and the conservation crew. There was interest for the workshop, but they felt they didn't know anything or too much about conservation and felt maybe they, it wouldn't be uh, right for them to come, but we, told everybody to come anyway, to learn about it. So the workshop uh, was a huge help to us and me and my summer student, and we continued the process of conservation, other artifacts. One person I think did attend and brought an item to conserve. This one person then told uh, their friends about the workshop and how fun it was and uh, a learning experience. So now we get the community asking us, when are they coming back again? We want to, we have questions for them. So we do still need help. And my summer student at that time had said, wow, I'm being domesticated because she didn't like the iron. So that's my. Okay. Um, so then uh, to, uh, to respond to uh, Sylvia preoccupation in summer 2016, we, we offered three mini workshop um, with uh, four of my colleagues uh, from the conservation services at the CMC uh, at the time, Canadian Museum of History. 
Um, it was um, it was short, um, but uh, we tried to really focus on the uh, specific aspect that Sylvia identified uh, as a problem for her collection space and uh, for her exhibition space as well. But we really focus on the on the collection space. Um, so uh, Sylvia um, uh, facing was and still facing some uh, aspect of a uh, space. Uh, she have a very uh, small uh, storage um, uh, area and um, a mix um, type of uh, things stored there. Um, so, uh, and, and she identified four specific um, deterioration uh, factors in her uh, area. So we focus on that. Uh, the first, first things that we uh, focus on was the humidity, uh, relative humidity, who was very, very low during uh, winter time um, and very high during summertime with lots of radiation. And uh, as many people know, uh, those um, can cause very um, lots of problems. Uh, next slide, please. Like on the drums, for example. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's um, going to crack very easily. Um, high humidity can cause uh, mold on uh, some objects. Uh, so it's, it's something that we, we are a bit concerned of. And um, um, <clears throat> so we, we provide two data logger from the museum and um, we install them in a specific area where we can uh, control. Data logger is a good thing to, to have because they are we are, we are, um, they are very useful for monitoring, uh, not only on daily or monthly or yearly basis, but they are also a good um, support to, um, to show the maintenance people uh, where the problems are and, and what to fix. And uh, so that's a very good uh, base to discuss um, uh, with, with that. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, there are options to put silica gel in display cases, but it's not the best way to do it. It's really better to have um, to to, um, to have a, a humidity uh, setup between forty and sixty percent in the full, the wall space. It's it's what we try to do. Uh, the second aspect that we focus on was um, <clears throat> the insects and rodents. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, rodents, uh, like, like the proximity of the kitchen and the garbage bins, um, uh, proximity to the collection room was an issue because uh, tracks, uh, of course, tracks uh, rodents and then insects. Um, so we, we um, tried to find some uh, evidence of, um, of uh, presence in the hidden space and uh, we brought uh, rodent uh, traps, but also insect traps that um, we put on a specific area like uh, where we think they, uh, they are going to be. And um, we also uh, just um, help Sylvia to uh, put uh, together a logbook where um, it's, it's always good to keep uh, track of the presence of the uh, different uh, pests. So keeping um, date with location and numbers and uh, species, it's a good idea. And again, it can be used to discuss and, and explain the problem to the exterminator, for example. A third aspect, aspect that we um, work on was the light um, uh, level. Uh, was a, a window in the storage room that we, um, find very bright. So um, an easy way to uh, protect the collection uh, is just to install a curtain on the, uh, on the, uh, on the window. Um, on the exhibition was a problem with uh, light bulbs was very high on uh, lux level. So um, we uh, try to figure what we can use instead and just uh, maybe uh, go with uh, LED, uh, same types of light, so we don't need to have a change on the fixture, but really do a, a better control. This is a good example of, um, of light damage. Um, 
and uh, we try to um, avoid these kind of things, of course. Um, so the first, the first day, the first workshop being devoted to uh, the preventive conservation, what we call, so uh, working on these uh, fac factors who are um, uh, damaging. Um, the two other days being um, devoted to the physical aspect uh, of the storage. So we try to make space. Um, the, um, everything who was stored there, who was not uh, relevant to the collection, like uh, the Christmas decoration, we try to find another space uh, to store them. And um, we, um, we try to maximize, maximize, maximize the space uh, doing uh, rolling the, the flat uh, textiles, for example, um, and um, putting small um, or uh, fragile pieces on boards. Um, is is the, the fold um, one one thing? Uh, just is the fold. Next slide, please. Just that's the the flat textiles rolled. Uh, next slide. It's an example of, of, um, of the damage that can happen on bead stuff. Uh, so this is really important to ease the fold. When we have to fold piece like that, we really need to ease uh, that space just using paper. It's an easy way to do it. Um, next slides, please. We also um, just uh, recommend to not hanging very heavy pieces on a uh, cloth hanger. Uh, as we can see here, it's a bad damage on, on shoulders. Um, so it would be a lot better to put on a flat, flat or in the boxes. And boxes are, can be piles, so it's, it's, it's a good, good way to, um, to maximize um, uh, space. Uh, so we also put uh, little things in the plastic bags to protect against insects. Um, we can put small items in big boxes with some separation made of paper or cardboard. Um, so there are many ways to do that, to, to back maximum, maximize the, the room um, with care. Um, we also... Um, uh, do a bit of work with archive um, and um, we um, demonstrated some basic care like dusting and uh, reattaching the loose parts for example we don't want to lose any little part who are detached um, we talk about the issue of mold um, who's quite a problem in uh, cultural centers sometimes uh, and we give information where to find all the uh, needed uh, materials in the uh, local store like uh, um, uh, hardware or um, artistic stores. Um, these uh, three days have been uh, extremely short but uh, intense and challenging for us when we try to bring our expertise uh, to help as much as we can uh, with uh, issues identified by uh, Sylvia. Uh, we may come up with some ideas that she did like or maybe find inaccurate for her needs, but the goal for us was to provide a practical solution to specific problems. Um, it has been an extremely rich um, for us in learning and, uh, and sharing. Um, our only uh, regret is not being able to renew our implication on an annual basis because of the pressing priorities at the museum. Um, I guess Sylvia will give you an idea of what it looks like now after <laughs> some uh, work. Um, we, we know that there are lots to do still, and we know also that she's alone to do all the job. So uh, we realize that it's huge. And uh, so whatever we've done there was just a mini, mini help on, uh, on what she needs to, to do there. So Sylvia, if you would like to, um, to show uh, your 
space now. Okay. So I'll take a walk. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this is what the we were um, rolling up to, and that's what the, we had to be careful to iron. So this is the lodge space, just in case you're wondering. And Caroline, you will see as we come in, there's more stuff. <laughs> so this is how it looks now. We still have stuff on the hangers. Those are the ones that um, we loan out. And then, so we have a certain space like here designated for um, our craft workshops and everything. Um, the language, and this is the window she was talking about. So we have a curtain to draw down, but this is the, the space that uh, we have uh, more stuff in, and we use the crates, as you can see, uh, produce crates, and because we didn't have enough money to buy other kind of crates, so a lot of them are stacked up, which makes it easier. And all the boxes we continued on up there. So yeah, we've done tried... a huge job. So all our paintings are on the wall. So we know there's still a lot of work to do, and that's why we still need you, Caroline, <laughs> to come here. <laughs> But yeah, it's just to make use of what spaces we have and adjust everything. So yeah. That's great. That's great. You walk hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, last uh, slide, please. And uh, I will, we will, done. Merci beaucoup, Carolyn. Could you make watch Sylvia for sharing your story of such a respectful and continuous renewal of good faith in working together to care for, present, and convey important Indigenous stories of survival? Our final presenter is Michelle Gervais. Michelle is the CMH Collections Coordinator, specifically assigned to handle, store, move, be present for traditional care, and pack the museum's ethnographic material which is to say the indigenous tangible and intangible subject matter. Michelle will explain her unique role in working with these collections and aspects of her duties often not experienced or even considered in more mainstream types of collections care. Please welcome Michelle. Thank you, Jameson. Kwe Kwe, Shage Indigenous, Mikinak Dodem, Kichisipirini Dojaba. Hi, my name is Michelle. Um, as Jameson said, I'm the collections coordinator for the ethnology collection. Um, I started at the museum just in the summer of 2019, so I am fairly new. Um, but within my um, first year there, um, I was had the privilege and honor and great responsibility uh, to work with the ethnology collection. Um, I'm responsible for keeping track of objects uh, through a large digital database. There are approximately 65,000 objects in the collection. Uh, and each year, um, I kind of estimate, I, I access about 3% of that for uh, community visits and research visits and exhibitions. Um, and 3% is about two to 3,000 objects. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, we have a specific viewing room where if you come to the museum to access the collections, all the objects are laid out on a table or art racks um, for you to take your time and view. Um, originally for the symposium, I really wanted to take everybody on a physical tour of the space and show you our collections. So I'm sort of tagging along the rest of the presentations here to give you a slideshow version of this. Um, so next slide. <laughs> so I was trying to um, show you different examples of different storage methods that we had. Um, 
I really wanted to do maybe a box making workshop, but maybe that's something I can do um, in the future. Um, so here we just have a ethafoam support with uh, Tyvek material, nice soft Tyvek um, to line it and then put something like your scissors inside, which really confused my manager when he saw a pair of scissors in a very <laughs> fancy uh, storage mount. Um, just be aware that ethafoam does degrade. Uh, so about 30 years, um, you will start seeing it to yellow. Uh, next slide. Uh, here we have some rolled textiles. These are just tiny um, sashes, but uh, uh, we have acid-free tubing uh, with some mylar around, followed by the object with um, cotton in between. And there's a um, stocking net that covers the tube as well, um, similar to the, the, the medical stocking net that you would do when you get a cast. Um, and then we just have these little tiny wedges to make sure that nothing touches the ground. Uh, this is different than the storage you saw in Sylvia's area where they're actually hanging because these are smaller, this is sort of a temporary small thing. Uh, next. Um, you could also make custom boxes, um, which uh, Carolyn is really good at making custom boxes like this for, for moccasins with little uh, peak hole windows so you know what you're, you're grabbing off the shelves. Uh, our moccasin collection, our moccasins are accessed fairly frequently. Um, you can also purchase uh, boxes from archival suppliers such as Car McLean uh, or University Products in the States, which takes a little longer to ship now, uh, but anything they have on their websites are good to use. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here on your left, is uh, just some oversized drawers that we have, uh, the importance of keeping things flat. Um, like we mentioned, uh, someone mentioned reed mats in the previous, uh, not to roll them. So actually above here is a bunch of reed mats um, as well. Uh, and then on your right, we have about 30,000 prints and drawings in our collection, mostly um, Inuit. And uh, we have all these black uh, Solinger brand boxes that we store them in and uh, they are very heavy. So always remember to take into account the weight of any collections that you're storing. Next slide. Um, up next, we get creative. Um, my predecessor in my job, Penny Pine, um, sort of invented this project to store leggings. Um, so inside of these two, there's two pieces of foam board wrapped with the material and then the leggings go inside and the label goes on top and it makes a really neat compact storage area. Next slide. Uh, next we have uh, every year I get to have the Aboriginal interns, or sorry, Indigenous internship program, name changed, uh, <laughs> with me. And there was an intern in the past who developed a custom support for hats from her community. So in the center, uh, she tried to use as little like no glue, uh, nothing. So there's just a tube support in the center you see on the far right with sort of um, uh, cotton batting inside covered by, uh, you could use stocking out, you could use 100% uh, muslin, whatever. Uh, and then a tube around to just support the frame. Uh, and then just on a board so you don't uh, have to pick it up so often. Uh, next slide. Um, <laughs> here. Here we have a lovely creepy doll. Um, this was the only artifact nearby that I could snap a picture of. Uh, this is from our folk collection, but you could see how even just putting something on a piece of board and tying it to that board will uh, reduce the amount of uh, handling of the object. Uh, next slide. Um, textiles, uh, like Sylvia and uh, Caroline were discussing, uh, you always want to pad out any uh, folds or corners. So in the top left, uh, you can see how the t-shirt would fit in the box with no tissue paper. It would be very floppy and foldy. Um, so what you really want to do, if you look at the bottom left, is put a tissue tube in between. Um, this is my spare t-shirt I keep at work. And yes, it is Black Panther. Uh, next slide. Uh, now we have just simply putting objects on shelves if they're stable. Um, they're free to live as they are. Um, so here's an example of a basketry row, which I know Talina loves. <laughs> Next slide. 
Uh, for our restricted materials, um, so in 1993, following interaction since the 1970s, as uh, Jameson was talking about, the CMH formalized its work with Indigenous communities and individuals on special care of sacred and ceremonial materials. For care instructions and ceremonial arrangements, museum staff work with traditional practitioners from the communities of origin to arrange for visitors and appropriate care. The museum then acts upon their recommendations for handling instructions, storage, access, and when applicable exhibition. Ceremonial care of materials identified by the communities are as sacred is arranged through the Indigenous Relations Office. So I chose a picture of uh, fabric because uh, often uh, some of our requests are for bundling, so using 100% muslin or a specific designated colored fabric to cover objects in our restricted section um, of our collection storage. Next slide. Uh, we also have our lovely oversight storage room uh, with lots of canoes and kayaks and umiaks um, galore. Um, I've got to forklift one kayak into its uh, storage space, which I was very proud to do. Uh, last, last summer in the before times, we had a researcher uh, come and was looking at structures of kayaks. Um, so that was really interesting to hear him speak from a, from a maker's perspective. Uh, so I get a lot of little tidbits when researchers come. Uh, next slide. Uh, and now for the quick photo tour of our collections and conservation spaces. Uh, so uh, Caroline Machin is one of our conservators. Uh, this is our general lab. Um, uh, so there's actually four nice big tables uh, to work on objects with. Next slide. Uh, this is the Carolyn's lab, actually, uh, <laughs> what she has blurred out behind her. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is our textiles lab. Um, so you can see we have a, a blanket out um, on the table, which I remember we had removed from exhibition. It was going back into storage. Um, next slide. Uh, here's some work, uh, our preparation department uh, we're lucky to have on site. So here they are building a custom mount for a canoe. Next slide. Uh, we also do casting and molds. Uh, there's a lot of archeological casting and molds in our collections. Um, I was only able to find a picture of this bust. Sorry, it's not a First Nations object. It's just what we had on the network. Uh, pass, or not pass, um, next slide. Uh, and lastly, here's another photo um, of a wonderful mannequin that we had made in house um, for uh, an Inuit uh, coat and female coat. Uh, and on the right is uh, just a selection of like little mounts that would kind of claw grip something. Um, and lastly, next slide. Right, so uh, the resource center at the museum is who you contact to arrange to access the collections. Um, right now, um, our friend uh, Sarah McFarlane, who was supposed to present, has moved on to a new job uh, and new challenges. So we wish her good luck. And I'm just gonna read her slides really quickly for her. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we always recommend uh, that you start early to get a list together of what objects you wanna see on site and uh, staff here will help you search online through the catalog should you have any issues or uh, need special terminology to get what you want. Um, then you contact the museum, the specialist. So we have artifacts, plural, at historymuseum.ca is a generic email address. We'll bring you to one of our staff members. We offer access to our library, archives, archeological collections, and artifacts. Uh, for regular visits on site, it's important to tell us your deadline because it usually takes about four to six weeks for us to pull the objects. Uh, the objects I personally remove from the storage room, they'll go to someone like Caroline, who will give them a quick assessment and and then we get them ready for the day you visit. Um, and that's, that's usually the main portion of my job at work and I enjoy that very much. And I can't wait to have people on site again and to start accessing uh, the collections again once, uh, once everybody gets vaccinated and we can all return to normal, right?
Um, so again, if you want to, if you have questions about accessing the collections, research, um, receiving reports on objects right now or, for, or detailed photographs is something we can do. It's artifacts with a plural S at historymuseum.ca. Thank you. Next slide. I think that's it. Oh, it's just me. Okay. <laughs> thanks so much, Michelle. Um, and thanks to everybody else. Jameson, did you have any concluding remarks? Yeah, I did. I, uh, for, first of all, I wanted to uh, add what I forgot to put in my, my speaking notes, uh, which is a really exciting project that the museum's going through right now, which is to revamp. Uh, we're working with the facilities uh, people and, and uh, looking for an architectural to revamp uh, firm to revamp the new sacred materials area. So there'll be a bigger dedicated space specifically for storage of sacred materials. And it'll have a, an attached uh, visitation room and, and ceremonial space. So that's an exciting project that we're involved in right now. Um, what I wanted to say was on behalf of us all, it's been a pleasure to share a small portion of the work that we do. As a daughter of several generations of Haudenosaunee iron workers can confidently say, we're building bridges, connect, journey, and put structure in place when creating landscapes on what is affectionately known to many of us as the Great Turtle Island. Thank you very much. Anyawe uh, Jameson. <laughs> I think that is the most accurate description of the work that is happening both at CMH and the other institutions who have been presenting um, over the past two days, the OMA included in that. Um, so we have just a couple uh, minutes uh, that uh, OMA has given us uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, but if anybody has any questions that they'd like to post to the panelists, um, please feel free to put it into the Q&A section. And one of the things I was just uh, wondering while we wait for a question, um, I think Jameson, you mentioned this about uh, not placing an undue burden on the communities that we're working with. Um, and so I was wondering if really quickly you could just uh, speak to ways of avoiding that. And then we have another question. Thank you, Polly. Uh, um, in, in our experience, sometimes we make a plan and something will happen in the community that we can't carry it through. So uh, we need to be really aware of if, if there are emergencies in the community, if there are issues with infrastructure, if there's a death in the, in the family in a small community, it's going to affect everyone. So we need to change our plans and be respectful of that sort of thing. Uh, if a community is uh, going through a change of election, for example, we may not be able to reach out to them if there's a change in, in leadership. Um, we may not know the specific people that are, are um, best available to contact at that particular moment. So it's just a matter, I think, of being really respectful of the fact that everyday lives of indigenous people in the communities is far different than the, the life of operating the National Museum in, in the National Capital Region. So um, we try our best to make sure that the staff are aware of that and, and that there's no sort of expectation uh, when something, you know, doesn't go as planned. Thanks, Jameson. Um, Talina, did you want to answer Pauline's question so that everybody can see slash hear it? The question is about the, where funding is being used from Canada, um, Canada Council for the Arts. Yeah, just give me one second to get the full, um, the full explanation of the thing. You move to another question and then I'll come right back, okay? Sure. Okay. So in the meantime, we have a question from Heather, uh, Heather Hatch, about how to manage cultural sensitivities when working with non-Indigenous volunteers. Um, I could probably tackle that one. Um, uh, like I mentioned, every year I have the Indigenous internship program. So obviously I work with them with the collections. But because Ottawa, we also have the uh, Algonquin College uh, Museum program, we frequently get interns from there who uh, come and help me from time to time um, if I'm overloaded. Uh, but generally, I, if it was a non-Indigenous person, I would make sure it was very clear 
what the handling instructions were. Um, normally a non-Indigenous volunteer would not ha uh, handle restricted material. Um, that will be the sole responsibility of me or one of my coworkers if I'm not available. Um, any restricted material is usually pre-approved for access. Uh, so non-Indigenous interns who are technically volunteering their time, um, I would work with them um, on whatever the project was and make sure that they feel comfortable in what they're doing. And I understand that they understand what they're doing. So <laughs> that's that. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and we also, I should mention, Jameson said this in her presentation, we had something called the PATH, which was training that was done for all of the employees at the museum to get us all sort of like Indigenous Studies 101. So we had a baseline to work from, um, and that was really, really helpful, I think. Um, so uh, great anonymous attendee question. Uh, is there any way to uh, donate and support Sylvia's efforts uh, with the Kidgan CB Collections Care? So Sylvia, how can we donate? <laughs> um, I guess contact me uh, directly. Uh, I think you have my email, sylvia.more at kza.qc.ca or contact us through our Facebook uh, inbox account. Thanks or so call, <laughs> or call. <laughs> Um, and then just, uh, Talina, did you want to read that answer out or do you want me to do that? Sure. Yeah, um, sorry, it was the Canada Council for the Arts Long-Term Projects Grant in Creating, Knowing and Sharing uh, Arts and Cultures of First Nations, Inuit and Métis People. Thanks so much. So definitely look in diverse areas for funding, I think is part of the answer to that question. It's not always museum based funding that we use. Uh, another recommendation I would put out there is if you can partner with a local university um, or college, they may have access to different pools of funding than we do in the museum field, for example, Social Science Humanity Research Council funding. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. I think that's all I've got in the question queue. Okay, so uh, again, I want to thank everybody so much for sharing your time and your knowledge and your great energy with us and Sylvia, especially for that tour. That was so awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.